Hello, sadly it's a bit cold and it's going to get a bit dark this evening to be coming to you live from Poole, but hopefully we'll be sharing some images, videos and insights that will help us all feel like we're actually there this evening. Thank you very much for joining us for tonight's event where we'll be exploring the secret life of Poole Harbour. My name is Emma and I'll be your host for this evening. As the second largest natural harbour in the world, Poole is home to a vast array of wildlife. Tonight we'll be exploring how Bournemouth University is helping to support these creatures and their habitats, both above and below the water. Here's what we've got coming up this evening. We have two speakers, Professor Roger Herbert and Professor Richard Stillman, who will be talking to us about creating homes for wildlife in Poole Harbour and predicting how environmental change affects coastal birds. We'll have a short break in between our two presentations and plenty of time at the end for discussion and question and answers with both of our speakers. So please do use the ask a question box at the bottom right of your screen to pop any questions that you have for both Roger and Richard throughout the event. And we'll try and get through as many of them as we can in the discussion at the end. We'll be closing the event at around 8.30 p.m. This is the third event in our online public lecture series where we're showcasing some of the ways in which Bournemouth University research is having an impact on the world around us. To tell us more, here's a short message from our Vice-Chancellor, Professor John Vinney. Thank you for joining us for this evening's public lecture, which highlights research brilliance at Bournemouth University. The lecture series covers many of our areas of academic strength, from healthy ageing to protecting the environment championing culture and heritage, challenging marginalization, managing crisis and disaster, and helping to support Dorset's economy. We're very proud of all the work that we do at the university and the impact that it has on the world. And I hope that this evening's lecture really provides you with a, a new insight into the work that we're doing to change the world and make it a better place. We're using Crowdcast for tonight's event. For those of you who aren't familiar with this platform, there's just a few things to be aware of. Firstly, we're not going to be able to see or hear you. Only our speakers will have their cameras and their microphones on. That means the best way to interact with us and with each other is through the chat box on the right-hand side of your screen. And it's great to see some of you already using this to introduce yourselves and let us know where you're coming from. Um, welcome to all of you. Please do continue to use this throughout the event to share any thoughts, comments, or observations that you have. Our speakers may also have some questions for you as well. So they'll be using polls throughout their talks um, to get some insights from you. These will appear on the bottom right of your screen just next to the ask a question box and will be multiple choice questions that are completely anonymous. So please don't be worried about saying the right or wrong thing and um, just get involved because we really wanna hear from you this evening. Without further ado, uh, let's get started with tonight's event. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker this evening, Professor Roger Herbert, who's going to be talking to us about introducing artificial reefs and rock pools at Pool Harbour. Hi, Roger, over to you. Good evening, and thank you for that introduction, Emma. Uh, delighted to be here this evening. Um, as uh, Emma mentioned, I'm a marine biologist at uh, the university and have been working in Pool Harbour for about 20 years. Um, I'm really interested in all aspects of uh, marine biology, but I'm really a specialist in, in uh, intertidal ecology and shallow, in, uh, shallow water um, coastal ecology. Um, I started off looking at the distribution of different species across the English Channel, really, in response to warming. And of course, that was prior to the uh, concern that we have really now about climate change. So I've been carrying on that work and also thinking about how we can adapt to climate change um, using our knowledge of marine ecosystems. So uh, Pool Harbour, well, um, where is it? Well, it's, a, um, it's, it's on the south coast of England and it's uh, west of the Isle of Wight and uh, the Solent region. Here's a bit of a zoom in, hopefully. You'll see it located um, just uh, just to the northeast of the Isle of Purbeck, I suppose. And um, if you, uh, I guess you recognise some of these names, Sandbanks, for example, Bournemouth, of course, and, and Pool Harbour. Um, it's an interesting harbour. Um, very, very commonly regarded as the second largest harbour in the world. I'm not going to dispute that here on 
video, but it's certainly one of the largest estuaries we have uh, in Europe. And uh, the harbour itself is um, very interesting because the south part is relatively undeveloped. Lots of natural habitats, low cliffs, salt marshes. Whereas on the north coast, it's very urban, um, artificial embankments, seawalls, wharves, and um, marinas. Uh, scale wise, it's about four to five kilometers across the widest point, say from Poole uh, to the uh, southern shore. Uh, but notice the very narrow entrance, only about 300 meters. So when the tide is coming in, it goes in very rapidly. And of course, it goes out rapidly. For the rest of the time, of course, uh, parts of the harbour are very, very shallow and, and, and quite quiet in terms of um, movement of water. So let's have a look at uh, one of the sort of most iconic landmarks, I think, in, in Poole, which is Brown Sea Island. We should have a slide of, um, of the harbour with Brown Sea Island. And uh, there are five islands in Poole Harbour. Brown Sea Island is owned and managed um, by the National Trust. Now, notice that lagoon right in the foreground of the harbour. Now, that was farmland back in the 19th century, and it's be, it was reclaimed from the sea in the mid-19th century from salt marsh. Well, of course, as you can see, it's not farmland or salt marsh at the moment. It is actually a lagoon protected by an old sea wall. And of course, there are have been quite frequent overtopping events over the years. In fact, the National Trust have had to raise the sea wall by about 30, 30 centimetres back in 2003, four, I think it was. But wonderful area, wonderful habitat, great for birds, great for other lagoon wildlife. And the island itself is, is magnificent. So what about other habitats um, in, in the harbour? Um, well, um, you at low tide of course um, we have extensive mudflats and uh, you can see this was actually this shot was taken during a survey we had about um, 15 years ago and um, from the hovercraft which we you borrowed from the RNLI kindly donated for the survey by the RNLI it, you could be in the middle of the harbour and it could be a really remote and wild place as I think this this diagram this uh, slide uh, shows beautiful morning and showing the most important habitat arguably in the harbour mud estuarine mud very rich in invertebrates and um, uh, of course that those of course are fed upon by other organisms fish and and wading birds Other habitats. Well, there is uh, an important area of seagrass in the harbour. There are other patches um, in various parts of the harbour, but in the sort of um, uh, northeastern part of the harbour, just behind sandbanks, uh, there is a very important area of seagrass. Now, of course, there's a lot of interest in seagrass at the moment because it's able to capture carbon dioxide very effectively. And uh, when the plant material dies and is buried in the sediments, that material can be stored. That carbon can be stored for long periods of time. So it's very important for carbon sequestration. It's also important for a, ha as a habitat, particularly for juvenile fish and other marine life. And seahorses, of course, are known to use this habitat as indeed others in the harbour. It's also very important for stabilising the sediments of the harbour too. So over and all, we must look after our seagrass and it's wonderful to have some in the harbour. So what's what you can see from this picture, of course, is the other important habitat. It's not a marine habitat, but surrounding the harbour, you've got a wealth of terrestrial um, wildlife and habitats, heathland, for example, in the foreground. But as well as the wildlife, what else uses the harbour? Well, of course, we do. We use it for recreation. We use it for industry. And uh, you can see these yachts um, and the owners, no doubt, enjoying uh, a lovely afternoon uh, in some quiet creek in the harbour. So it is a harbour that is used by wildlife and people. And often in these areas, like many estuaries, uh, you can get conflicts. But we're not going to talk about that today because um, we have a biodiversity and climate crisis uh, 
uh, globally, and this is also applicable in Pool Harbor. Now, one of the uh, issues that, of course, we are faced with is, is flooding, coastal flooding as a result of sea level rise. Now, sea level is rising due to rising temperatures and the thermal expansion of the oceans, which results in the melting of glaciers too. But we, even without the melting of glaciers, the sea level is rising. Now, this interesting map shows an area which uh, of Pearl Harbor, which could be flooded maybe once in 50 years. And you can see that orange area extending beyond the existing coastline is an area which could be flooded. And you can see that that is quite extensive in the south of the of the harbour. Um, but and in parts of the two embayments to the north, that's um, Litchit Bay and Holes Bay, right at the top there. Um, but what's happening around Pool and uh, Bournemouth? Um, what, what's going to happen to the sea there when it rises? So what, um, what of course, we have witnessed in, in recent weeks and months is um, terrible floods. Here's uh, Storm Eunice uh, flooding parts of the Sandbanks Peninsula just near the harbour entrance there. Um, huge waves and resulting wind, you know, causing flooding of, of Banks Road. What about in the west of the harbour? Well, here around Halton Heath, we have got natural habitats. We've got marshes and salt marshes. Now, when it floods, these habitats can absorb and accommodate, if you like, the, the flood waters, the rising waters. And uh, these are wetland habitats. They're really, really important for wildlife perhaps not a, so much of a problem for us in these regions. So perhaps what we need to think about also, therefore, is what happens at the other end, the, around the developed coast, around Pool Harbour itself. So around Pool Quay, we've got industry, um, we've got um, uh, wharves, we've got infrastructure here, which is crucial to the local economy and of course a lot of that is protected by sea walls concrete sea walls so when the sea rises it rises up and down the sea wall and here we have an area of sea wall which has had to have been uh, raised in the last few years because of flooding in Pool Harbour so coastal infrastructure wildlife what's the problem well, we've got a biodiversity crisis as well as a climate crisis. And there is a real risk that our intertidal habitats, our seashores, will in fact no longer be seashores when the tide rises, the sea level rises. And on our developed coast, the sea will just be rising and falling up and down a hard sea wall because we've had to protect the coast. This is what we call coastal squeeze. So what we've got to do is try to compensate somehow for the loss of habitat as a result of coastal squeeze and try and think about how we can redesign coastal infrastructure, sea walls and breakwaters to actually create new habitat for wildlife. Now, if we think of what a, uh, an ordinary sea wall is like, uh, it's uh, an ordinary sea wall is um, very robust, it's made of stone or concrete, but it's not very, very attractive to, for wildlife. It's smooth, it's steep, so it dries out very, very quickly. And what wildlife needs is, uh, that is seashore wildlife, it needs a refuge from the heat of the day when the seashore is exposed to the sunshine of the day and the heat of the day. So we need to create on these sea walls some sort of habitat which provides a refuge for wildlife at low tide and high tide. Here's another example. Now, you'd think that that breakwater there would be a great habitat for wildlife. Lots of rocks and boulders. It looks fairly natural, doesn't it? But actually, those steep, angular boulders are a quite harsh environment. They drain very quickly. They get very hot. Now, there's something missing, very importantly, from those 
that seashore environment that you see there it's an artificial seashore if you like it's boulders it's a breakwater but it's missing something and what it's missing is water water at low tide now i've given you a clue here to a question i want you to think about this question and do please type in the chat if you were designing an artificial habitat to be perfect for marine wildlife what would you include what features would you include in that habitat do add something in the chat if you would like so for example what surfaces would you like what kind of rocks would you perhaps think about uh, Lindsay says a small pool yeah pools we all need to cool off in pools don't we niches that hold water rock pools mud yes indeed mud um some great answers in the chat here um yeah vegetation would be good to get vegetation we might need to help it along a bit by creating the right habitat so yeah we want those habitats the challenge is how do we get them on a sea wall how do we get them on the urban coast because that is an area which is being squeezed okay so if we look at a natural habitat here's a natural rocky seashore not far from Paul this is at Kimmeridge in Dorset and this is a site we take students to uh, on a regular basis to study the marine life um, of the seashore here now if we zoom in onto that seashore which we see at low tide we can see that actually there are lots of different habitats. There's crevices and grooves and nooks and crannies. And you can see some little snails there just gaining a refuge uh, in those areas at low tide so they can keep damp and moist and protected from the rigors of the sun and the heat of the day. And if we look even closer, we can see that actually there are small little pools, rock pools. And these refuges at low tide are what's missing from a lot of our coastal infrastructure. It does a great job, do sea walls, at protecting us from um, the, the rising sea levels and storms, but they're not that great for wildlife. So the challenge is how can we make them better? And one answer is to actually create rock pools on sea walls. So one of the projects that we've been doing in the last few years, working with international partners under the uh, EU project Marinef, is to design and install and monitor artificial rock pools. Now, it seems a daft idea, doesn't it, in a way, putting rock pools on a seawall, but we didn't know whether it was going to work or not. Uh, these are concrete, low carbon concrete rock pools. They're made by Art Ecology on the Isle of Wight, one of our project partners. And uh, they're handmade. They're wonderful little pools. They've been um, designed uh, using, uh, they've used um, a bubble wrap as a mold to give that external part of the pool a texture for snails and other organisms to sort of hang on to. And we've been monitoring these rock pools over the last couple of years since they were installed. And I think there might be a clip. Oh, uh, yes. And what we've noticed is, of course, how they've changed over time. Three months post installation, they look very green. Um, and now the exterior has browned over. We've got grazers coming in, periwinkles and other organisms coming in grazing, and the habitat is changing. And we've been monitoring the external part of the pool as well as obviously what's living in the pool itself. And here's a, a clip here now showing uh, some of our research staff monitoring the rock pools. And um, these are monitored not only in the uh, peak of summer, but also midwinter. So it can be quite challenging. Now, this is quite shortly after they were installed. You can see they were green. They didn't look particularly attractive externally at this time. But you'll notice they filled up with water very nicely. And very quickly, shortly after installation, we were seeing lots of wildlife in there. We were seeing prawns and as you can see crabs in the rock pools. Notice the wide variety of seaweeds also, which are appearing in the rock pools. 
And we've been continuing to monitor these over the last uh, couple of years. And we found uh, a good number of species now. We're finding snake lots and eminies, which we find in natural pools. Um, and uh, we have found um, sea squirts, which are filter feeders. Now, this is interesting because at the tidal level that we've installed these rock pools, which is about uh, mid-tide level to uh, me, mean high water neeps, so an average tide, we would not normally see this wildlife on the sea wall. It needs water. But more importantly, and more interestingly, these would be species that you'd normally find quite low down on the seashore. And what we've been able to do is create a habitat, a refuge for them, which is higher up in their tidal in the tidal range. So they could almost move up as the tide increases, as the sea level increases over time. So we're quite encouraged. We're, we were particularly encouraged to see this beautiful fish appear um, on one of our monitoring events. This is this goby here, the, sorry, the Montague's Blenny, is a rock pool specialist. And this, when we found this, this was the first record of this species in the harbour. And it's a rock pool specialist. So we were encouraged that maybe we're on the right track here. So that's uh, intertidal environments and sea walls. But of course, there's lots of other coastal infrastructure and we may need to um, develop other parts of our urban coast for wind turbines or other um, infrastructure um, and we've got to think multifunctionally here we've got to think how we can not only design something that is going to fulfill the main function of the um, the development but what what can we do in order to encourage wildlife to colonize this site as well so another project we've been involved with is trying to sort of using artificial reef research to create artificial reef modules which perhaps could be certainly in applications around urban coasts used as building bricks for new coastal infrastructure now these um, have been uh, designed and constructed again under a different European project called 3D Pair, 3D printing artificial reefs for the Atlantic. And these are 3D printed low carbon concrete modules, approximately one cubic meter in size. And uh, they've been de designed by a partnership uh, across Europe and uh, deployed in different parts of Europe and we've got them deployed just outside Pool Harbour along the training bank and we've had them there for almost two years and you can see they've got lots of holes in them they've got tunnels they've got um, overhangs which provide shade very importantly uh, and a, a place to cling on for um, for different species and you can see there's um, a black and white target on that um, block there which was deployed um, uh, off the training bank. We've got nine, nine of them deployed off the training bank, different, slightly different shapes and sizes. Um, but uh, we can photograph these underwater and look at changes over time. And uh, this is um, that same reef module five months later. And you can see it doesn't take long to, to colonize with marine life. And how do we go about surveying? Well, scuba, of course, is the obvious one. And uh, so we've been surveying these seasonally um, for the last two years, looking for the changes that have been taking place. And we've observed quite a lot of changes in the variety of life that uh, occur on these reef blocks. We've also been using remotely underwater, remote underwater video and also baited and unbaited stereo cameras as well to get an idea of the uh, species which are colonizing, but also the size of species which are beginning to colonize the reefs as well. So quite a lot of work using multiple techniques so that we could try and characterize the habitat as accurately uh, as possible. So what 
wildlife might colonize an artificial reef. Now, an artificial reef perhaps placed in the seas across Dorset or outside Port Harbour. Perhaps you could just type some ideas in the in the chat. Any suggestions? What might colonise? Sea anemones, prawns. Yes, we found both of those. Mollusks and fish, crabs. You're very much on the right track. Seaweed. Good to see that mentioned. Lobsters, congers, yeah, mussels. Um, I'm not sure that we've actually recorded mussels yet. I might be wrong. Barnacles, certainly we have done that. Yeah, we found lots of barnacles. Coral is mentioned there. Well, not corals that you would find in tropical regions. Uh, we're not tropical uh, in pool yet, um, but um, we do have soft corals. And in fact, sea anemones are very closely related to corals. Um, and so we don't get the the um, the um, habitat forming corals that you'd get in the tropics. Starfish, yes. Great. Well, it's wonderful to see all those um, mentioned there. Great informed audience. Yeah, and it provides a sheltered nursery. So we've got a bit of a quiz for you here. And I'm sure you're going to cope with this really, really well, because uh, we've got some great answers in the chat there. So here are some fish that you might uh, see uh, on the, um, on the uh, reef. Now, I wonder if um, I'm going to show you a bit of video in a moment. And I want you to tell me how many of these or which species of these you see on the video. Now, if you've got a camera handy, you might want to take a, a quick photo of this slide, which you can use for reference. Or, of course, you can um, use your own knowledge. So uh, give you a moment or two just to take a photo if you need to of that slide and then we're going to play you the video and then we're going to tell you which ones uh, we hope that you will have seen okay Well, well, I wonder how many you got right. I can see quite a few, quite a few correct answers in the chat there. In fact, you should have seen all of those. Um, Ballon wrasse was the really large fish that came in from right to left. Corkwing wrasse with the spot on the tail. Gold sinny spot with a different position. There was some red mullet that came and went. The cheeky Tompot Blenny on the right that sat on the, the pole. We use that white pole as a scale bar, really. We sometimes put some bait at the end of it to track fish, but we weren't at the time. We didn't see a bass in that. You might have done, but we couldn't find a bass in that footage. That was taken from the middle of Pool, um, pool Bay on natural reefs but we're seeing most of those species now around the nine or so modules that we've put down by the training bank well done for all those who got the right answers and uh, we might be able to put that video clip up again at some other point 
uh, so that you can I can go through that with you. But what other wildlife uh, might you see on the reefs? Well, um, remember all those little holes and nooks and crannies? Well, they are a great haven for crabs, uh, velvet swimming crabs, spider crabs. Um, there's lots of different species in the holes and tunnels themselves. Little cuttlefish on the right there, which we've seen um, inspecting the reefs, very curious animal. Um, that is too. So we've got another clip here um, of the reef units. Um, more recently, you can see, you can perhaps might be able to look into the tunnels. You can see the tube worms on the side there. And what have we got inside? There might be something in there. Oh, yeah, there's a spider crab um, that's in there that's a bit disturbed, but we'll leave him be for a while. What's in this one coming up? There's another crab in there. I think that could be a velvet swimming crab in that in that tunnel. Another velvet swimming crab. And uh, so that one doesn't look as though it's um, anything in there at the moment. Um, but around the outside, of course, lots of seaweed and the small, small wrasse, as you can see very important for juvenile fish as i think some people mentioned these modules quite encouraging to see how they've been colonized well um i hope you found that interesting i really look forward to um, seeing what questions you might have for us later and um, i'm going to hand back to to emma now Thank you, Roger. That was really interesting. And it was fascinating to see some of those creatures that are colonising those reefs and rock pools. Um, it seems almost counterintuitive in a way, though, to be introducing more man-made features to these environments. So what do you think the benefits are of using things like concrete um, rather than trying to restore some of those natural habitats that are perhaps being lost? That is an extremely good question, Emma. And uh, it is very important to emphasise that these habitats um, uh, these methods for restoration are really only appropriate for open coasts uh, for uh, urban coasts so around the urban parts of pool harbour pool bay and where we need to put structures in the marine environment we can learn from this material from this research to try and think about how we can create multifunctional structures structures that not only fulfill their original and main um, requirement but also for wildlife too so artificial reefs have been used for in many parts of the world for restoring habitats but in this area it's really how we can use this technology um, to um, enhance wildlife in urban areas which are built up anyway and not in the middle of pool bay Brilliant. Thank you, Roger. And we have plenty of questions coming in um, using the ask a question box. Just a reminder that we'll have time at the end of the evening for questions to both Roger and our second speaker, Richard. So please do keep posting those um, and also voting on each other's questions. So if you spot a question in there that you particularly want to see answered in our discussion at the end, then click on the um, arrow to the left hand side of that question to upvote it. And we'll get to the most popular questions um, in our question and answer session at the end of tonight's event. Um, we're going to take a short break now um, before before I introduce our second and final speaker for this evening, Professor Richard Stillman. So um, please do use this time to stretch your legs, um, grab a drink, uh, move away from your screen. We'll be back in five minutes, so we'll see you soon. <laughs> 
Welcome back everyone, I hope you enjoyed that short break. Now it's time to introduce our second speaker for this evening, Professor Richard Stillman, who's going to be talking to us about some of the birds that live in Pool Harbour and how we can predict how environmental changes might affect them. Hi Richard, over to you. Great, thank you Emma. So good evening everybody, it's great to be able to speak to you. Um, yeah, I'm going to be talking about some of the birds that live in those muddy bits of Pool Harbour. So um, Roger mentioned that at the start, the mud is a really important area and the birds that live in that mud are really important as well from a conservation perspective. I'll talk a little bit about myself at the, uh, about myself at the start and then we go in to think about what the lives of these birds are like. And then importantly, how we try to predict how change might affect these birds. So a really important sort of conservation question is often, if there's gonna be some sort of change to a site, what effects will that have on the animals that live within the site? So the birds in this particular case. So just to get us started, it'd be great if you could just type into the chat some of the birds that you've seen recently, um, new arrivals, for example, have you seen a swallow? or have you seen a herd of cuckoo yet? Sort of thing, just as we go through, because um, as hopefully will come out of this, my presentation, I really like birds, basically. So just seeing names of birds makes me happy. I like seeing them, but seeing the names is great also. So uh, someone's uh, seen a few swallows. So yeah, I've seen swallows around, which is great. Cormorant, nice bird, seabird to see. Black red start someone has seen. So that's one of my favorite birds, really good. More swallows, red kite, egrets, swallows, osprey. Great, so we've got a few birds here that people have seen. Lots of these are new arrivals. So these are birds that will spend the, the summer in this country. A lot of them house martins, white throat, things that are just arriving at this time. So the birds that we research or the birds that live in the muddy bits of Pearl Harbor are birds that um, spend the winter here. So they've left a month or so back. Port white-tailed eagle, really good. So really nice range of birds. Chetty's warbler, great as well. So these are some of the birds on the screen now that, that we work on, birds that live within Pearl Harbor. We've got a bar-tailed godwit in the left-hand corner. So if you see a bird that looks like that around sandbanks, it's more likely to be a bar-tailed godwit. Uh, turnstone, top right. So this is a bird species you might often see at the top of the shore. Oyster catcher, bottom left, possibly one of the birds with the most incorrect name. They tend to eat mussels and cockles. They don't really eat sort of um, oysters. And then Avocet, uh, bottom right, the emblem of the RSPB, uh, Royal Society for Protection of Birds, a really elegant bird there as well. So great. Thanks very much for all those um, birds that um, people have put up. It's really nice to see the, the sorts of things that, you, that you've that seen. I'm going to, as Roger did at the start, I'm going to give a bit of background to myself now and sort of where I've come from, what my interest in birds is, but also my interest in computers as well, because the research that we do really ties those two interests together. So we have a bit of a, a walk back in time now to see me in the 1970s. Can't quite see the flares there, but I think they were there. So I'm from London originally, and I guess like a lot of people who are from urban environments but have an interest in wildlife, um, seeing wildlife is something that it's difficult to do. So really birds were the main exposure to wildlife that I think I had as a child, especially when I was fishing as well. So I've carried that enthusiasm for birds all the way through my life really. Um, and when I was at, at university, um, I got uh, be, was befriended by some very keen bird watchers, twitchers, as they're called. If anyone's a twitcher, maybe you can mention that in the chat. So twitching is like hardcore bird watching. It's trying to amass the total number of birds that you've seen in a day, in in your life, in the year, that sort of thing. It's all about trying to to find the total number that you can see. And twitching is great, it's really exciting, really enjoyable. And I think I'm still a twitcher at heart. I don't think that ever goes away. But when I was a twitcher, all I was really interested in was counting the number of things that I saw. It wasn't really about what they were doing. And so what I'd hopefully I'll get across to you is that if you think about not just the number of things that you see, birds that you see, but also what they're doing, it adds a completely new dimension to bird watching. 
So the next slide may be a sort of an unusual slide to see in a talk on birds in Pearl Harbor. So it's a Space Invaders game on an old fashioned computer. So I guess you could think that I'm of the Space Invaders generation, my sort of age. Uh, that was one of the games that was around when I was a, when I was a kid. And back in those days, life was simple and you could type in the code for computer games on your old Commodore 64 computer or whatever it might be. And by doing that, I learned how to program computers and computer programming is just really getting a computer to do something for you. So I got this interest in birds and I got the interest in computer programming that I'd learned through sort of practicing programming through um, uh, through typing in Space Invaders games. So we'll get back to Paul Harbour now, but that link between my interest in birds and interested in computer programming and particularly games is something that comes through in the um, in the research as we go through. So we'll get back to Paul Harbour and we'll have a nice aerial view. So Roger did a nice job of explaining the different parts of the harbour. If we think about the harbour from a bird's perspective, the birds that feed on the mud generally need to wait for the tide to go out in order to feed. So they've got to wait for low tide. Then they go onto the muddy parts of the harbour. So Paul Harbour is incredibly muddy. So most of it, is very muddy there's very few sandy places generally speaking mud is good for birds because mud is good for bird food so all those muddy bits might be treacherous for people but for birds they're sort of a haven of resources for food so that mud is really important brown sea island so roger showed a picture earlier of brown sea island in particular that lagoon um, so that lagoon is really important for the birds so when the tide is in they're not able to feed throughout much of the harbour, but they can feed in that lagoon. So that lagoon provides a vital sort of a topping up place for the birds. Other parts of the sort of greeny bits you might just be able to make out around um, bits of pool there. These are grassland areas, Pool Park and the Beta are some of the sort of local names for these places. So those are really important places for birds because again, they provide a place for them to feed. They can top up if they don't get enough food um, at, low, um, uh, at low tide. What this picture doesn't show, but I guess Roger hinted at it earlier with a picture of a boat, Paul Harbour is a great place for boats. It's also got a quite a strange tidal regime. So in most places, the tide is in for six hours, out for six hours. In Paul Harbour, the tide tends to be in more than it's out. So that is good for boats because there's somewhere to sail your boats a lot of the time but it's not so good for birds. They have less time to feed in Pearl Harbor than they typically do in other sites. So it's a relatively tough place in terms of the amount of time birds have got. It's good in terms of the mud, but the time is something that's not so, it's more of a sort of, um, it makes life more difficult for the birds. What we're gonna do now is just sort of go through the annual cycle of these birds from their arrival in the autumn through to their departure in the, um, in the spring. And I'll talk about some of the things that are going on for the birds over that period of time and just let you know what some of our research shows. It, uh, later on, I'll go into a bit more detail about the research, but I'll just give some of the, the overview now. So this is a sort of nice, mild looking picture of um, Paul Harbour, very inviting it looks. The birds arrive just about the time when most of the tourists will be leaving. So they arrive in the autumn. And between autumn and winter, it's actually quite a, um, the birds have a relatively easy time in the harbour. So it's relatively warm. So typically in the, in the same way that we shiver when it gets cold, birds need to expend extra energy if the, the temperature gets below a certain point. Typically autumn to mid midwinter, relatively mild. Most of the birds in the harbour don't need to expend extra energy just to survive over that time. The things they eat, the sort of worms and cockles and mussels and other types of shellfish and crustacea that live in and on the sediment, they've been breeding over the summer. So there's lots of them around. So the birds arrived from their uh, autumn migration. Most of these birds are breed further to the north. They've migrated south to get to uh, Pearl Harbor. They arrive at a time when there's lots of food, 
and the climate is relatively mild. So life is relatively easy for these birds at that time of year. The research that we've done shows that typically the birds are quite resistant to any changes. So if there's some adverse environmental change that occurs during this period of time, maybe more disturbance from people, for example, it tends not to feed through to have an adverse effect on the birds in terms of killing more birds than would have died in the absence of that change. So autumn to winter, it's a nice, relatively nice time to be in Paul Harbour if you're a bird that feeds on the mud. So as winter progresses, we get to the, the late winter to departure stage. So here we are, a slightly more cold looking Paul Harbour. The temperature has gone down. It's less, it's more cold. For most of the birds, the temperature now has got below the point at which they uh, need to um, expend extra energy in order to survive. Life's getting tougher from that perspective. Things they eat haven't been reproducing over this period of time, so they're getting more scarce. There's less food to go around. And also, life's relatively tough for the things that birds eat over this period of time, and so the quality of the prey tends to decline. So you've got a sort of double whammy of it getting colder, so the birds need to expend extra energy and also the quality of the food is declining too. So this is the time of year when the birds are up against it and our research shows that during this time of year if you do bad things to the birds within the models that you create it's much uh, the birds are much more vulnerable to environmental change. So I guess the main message at this point late winter departure is the time when the birds are at most risk. Okay, so we'll uh, we'll take a a brief uh, break from um, talking about Paul Harbour and the birds that live within it. And we'll have a, a little quiz here. So hopefully um, a little poll thing has appeared on your screen. And if you click on that, you should see a choice of different species. So could you click uh, on the voting button to tell me what species of bird you think this is. And I'll just sort of uh, either in the chat or clicking on the, the screen, then please do that. And I'll wait until a few sort of uh, votes have come in so that we can sort of uh, get a feel for what people think this actually is. So the reason that I'm talking about this is there is there are two types of goose that occur within Paul Harbour that look relatively similar. One of them is a species that is considered as a pest. It's an introduced species and it therefore is something that hasn't really got a, hasn't got a, hasn't got a particularly good press. And there's another species of bird that has flown to Paul Harbour to spend the winter and has migrated thousands of miles from the Arctic. So the answer, as most of you seem to have got, who've entered so far, this is a, a Brent goose. The picture that we can see is a Brent goose. The species that seems quite similar to a Brent goose, but isn't a Brent goose, is a Canada goose. So to someone who is a, um, a keen bird watcher, there are differences between Brent goose and um, uh, Canada goose, but maybe superficially they look quite similar. To someone who's not that interest in birds or just sees them in the distance, they will look virtually identical and they both would feed in similar places. So the grassy areas, uh, the parkland areas around Paul are really important for this species, the Brent goose, especially in late um, late winter. So most of you were able to, who answered were able to say that this was a Brent goose, so thank that's great, well done for that. This bird feeds uh, on the, the seagrass, the species that um, Roger uh, was talking about earlier. But if it can't get enough at low tide, it needs to feed on grassland areas. And the parks around Paul are really important for that. There was a really nice undergrad project that was done a few years ago that asked that same sort of question to people who work, walk their dogs and did recreation in those parkland areas where this where this species occurs. And quite a number of the people in that area thought that the it was a Canada goose, so a sort of pet spec, uh, pest species and not a Brent goose. When the student could then tell them that this these were Brent geese and they'd actually flown 
thousands of miles to be there, then people's attitudes towards the, the birds changed significantly. In other words, they were less they allow they were less prepared to allow their dogs to run amongst these birds and scare them off, causing uh, extra energy expenditure for the birds. So it's a really nice example of how an undergrad study can help us understand and uh, understand what conservation issues may be. So what we're going to do now, we're going to we're going to start shifting onto the the way in which we try to predict how sites such as Pearl Harbor or the birds within it may be affected by uh, environmental change. And what we need to do to do that is to learn to think like a bird. So it may seem a strange thing to do. I've spent an awful lot of my uh, career trying to think like a bird or get inside the head of a bird. If a bird was perceived in this environment, what would it do? Where would it feed? How, what would be the consequences of those different actions that it's took? And as I'll explain in the next slide, understanding the behaviour of birds is really uh, important in terms of understanding how change may affect them. So this is a sort of puzzled oyster catcher we can see here, and it's got three choices of where it would feed. It could go to the, the top patch, patch one, where there is lots of food. Those black blobs represent mussels that these birds feed on. But there's also lots of other oyster catches, there's lots of competitors. Or it could go to the bottom patch, it could go to the place where there's less food, but there's also less competitors. Or it could go in the middle patch where it's in between the two. So hopefully another poll should appear. And if you could just enter in that, where do you think this bird should go to patch one, patch two or patch three? So I'll just sort of um, let the, the, the poll settle down a bit. We've got a bit of a, a contest at the moment between the different options about where they where they may go. So at the moment, it looks like um, either lots of competition, lots of food, or maybe somewhere in the middle is winning out in terms of the place. But also we've got some people are saying, at the bottom, less competition, less food. And we've got a couple of things coming in on the chat, one and two, in terms of where they where they might go. So we've got a bit of a split decision on where this bird may actually particularly want to go. And I think it's sort of settled down now. The, somewhere in the middle is just winning out, but we've got lots of other options in terms of other places in where that bird may actually go. Well, I guess I should be honest, it's quite an un unfair question to ask answer, ask you because I actually got no idea where this bird would actually go to feed and the reason I don't know where it would go to feed is because where it would decide to feed would depend on ca its own particular characteristics so the fact we had a range of answers there I think is in a way is 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 sort of supporting it's a pretty difficult question to answer where would it go we don't know if this bird was a a dominant bird so it would win a lot of contests with others it would be successful at stealing food from others so oyster catchers if you watch them for a period of time you see little scuffles flutters of feathers that sort of thing one bird will come in and try to steal the food off another one if this is a really do dominant bird it would tend to do well in contests with others where would it go it would go to patch one at the top at the opposite end of the spectrum, you've got birds that are low on the dominance hierarchy. For whatever reason, they tend to lose a lot of contest with other competitors. If this was a subdominant bird, low on the dominance hierarchy, where would it go? It would go to the bottom because there's less food, but there's also less com competitors. If it went to the top patch, it would, every time it found food, another competitor would come along and steal it. If it was a, a bird of intermediate dominance, it would go somewhere in the middle. So this slide is touching on an area of um, um, maths, I guess it is, called game theory. So game theory is all about trying to understand what to do when the best thing to do depends on what another individual is doing. So if this is a subdominant bird, where does it go? It goes to the places where all the other birds have decided not to go to. 
So game theory, again, this is going back to that, in some way, back to the game, the, the space invaders, is a way of thinking about ecology where we're always thinking that animals are competing with each other in terms of what the best thing to do is. And this approach to thinking about the decisions that animals make is the basis of the modelling work that we do, the way in which we try to predict how change to the environment may affect birds. And what we'll do now is think about what one of these particular models may look like. So this is an overview of Paul Harbour. The different coloured um, dots on the screen represent different species of bird. Every time the, um, the screen uh, flicks, that's now going by. When it's blue, it means there's places, there's the, the tides in. When the colours appear, the tides out, there's places for the birds to feed. And it goes through that cycle. So the research that we do creates virtual versions of um, systems such as Pearl Harbor on the computer. It includes the different places where the birds could potentially feed. So earlier, Roger showed a picture taken from a hovercraft. In order to work out where the food is, you need to get to where the food is and effectively stick a glorified uh, drain pipe into the soil, into the sediment to take out a core of the, um, the mud and then look to see what is living within that mud. One of, because Paul Harbour is such a treacherous place, the survey using hovercraft is one of the ways that, that has been used to get out to these remote places to see what food is there for the birds. So we have the food for the, um, the, the birds, we have where it is, and we have how it's exposed by the tide. Each of these different dots is showing whereabouts in the harbour the, the birds would be predicted to feed. What we do is compare the predictions of the model with as many observations from the real world that we possibly can do. This is a model, and so it's never going to be perfect. There's always going to be some differences. So uh, someone has mentioned, are these roughly, roughly accurate representations? They're as accurate as, uh, as we can be. Um, and this is an animation of a, rel a relatively old model that I'm showing here. So don't worry too much about where the different species are actually predicted to be. Uh, being put. The key thing here is that each of these dots is working out for itself where is the best place to be. So in the same way that thinking like a bird picture had that um, the oyster catcher working out where to go, those sorts of processes are occurring all the time within this computer model. Why do we need a computer model? We need it because the world is relatively complicated and we couldn't fit all of these decisions inside our head. It was hard enough to work out where that one oyster catcher would go Think about trying to do that for thousands of oyster catchers, one after the other. We run, we start the model in uh, the autumn, and it runs through in our time steps until we get through to the, the the time when the birds leave. The model predicts where the birds are, how heavy they are, whether or not they survive at the end of the winter. We then look to see whether the model we've got, whether it's representing the real world accurately enough, and we try to make sure that it matches that. And typically we find that these, um, these um, models are able to predict where the, um, where the sort of, uh, where the bird, well, the difficulty that the birds are having surviving the winter. If birds are having difficulty, they would lose body mass and ultimately starve. And they're the sort of key predictions that we get out of it. We run it through for a sort of present day situation, and then we change things within the model to see what effect that might have on the predictions that we get. So the sorts of things that we uh, can do is to remove parts. So the sandy parts of the harbour, we could say, let's say people can get on the sandy bits around sandbanks, this is the right hand side here. We could remove that from the model, or we could remove that during daylight when people are, um, are likely to be there. And we could then see whether the birds that would have fed there would then feed somewhere else. There'd be slightly more competition in these other places. We could then run the model through to see whether more birds die because they're not allowed to go to sandbanks or whether the rest of the harbour is able to cope with the additional number of birds. So I guess the key thing here is that lots of sites where these birds feed aren't full up of birds necessarily. So if anything negative happens, it's not necessarily the case 
that more birds will die. If we think of a southern estuary such as Pearl Harbour, lots of these birds, they breed in the north and they're so tending to winter further north as time elapses. So the number in Pearl Harbour might be going down, not because Pearl Harbour is deteriorating, but because the birds are, are simply, they don't need to travel to Pearl Harbour to spend the, to spend the winter. So once we can then change things, and the sorts of things that we've done, uh, Catherine Ross was a PhD student, a, a research student here a few years ago. She developed models for Avocet. She looked to see the importance of that Brown Sea Lagoon for Avocet, and it turns out it's really important. Two other Catherines, Catherine Bowgen and Catherine Collop, developed a model to look at the effect of disturbance on the birds within the harbour. And Interestingly, we found that it was relatively difficult to kill birds in the harbour uh, by um, just increasing the number of people where they currently are, because most people are around the sandy bits and the birds have got lots of muddy bits to go to. To get an effect, there needs to be more disturbance to the birds in the parts of the harbour that uh, currently uh, birds, don't, um, uh, birds don't occur. Oh, sorry, people don't occur in. We've also used this approach to show how important these sort of grassland parky areas are for the birds that occur within these sorts of places. There may not be many birds there for a lot of the time, but the birds go there when they're really, really desperate. And so these places, the beta uh, parkland areas that might be under pressure from housing developments are actually really important for the birds. The birds are also vulnerable to sea level rise, especially if the shoreline is held and effectively the areas of intertidal habitat uh, become uh, become more become more scarce. Okay, so we've also, I think there'll be sort of links available to you where you can find access to websites where we go into a lot more detail about the sort of research that we've done in Pearl Harbor and, and elsewhere. So what I'll do now, I'll just sort of we're spread out a bit from Pearl Harbor and we think about other places within the UK that this approach has been has been adopted. So I'm not sure, sure how clear this will be, but there's a few dots on that map. So the same sort of modeling approach that we've applied to Pearl Harbor has been applied to a number of places throughout the country. And it's usually done because there's some conservation problem within a particular part of the, of the harbor. So for example, this modeling approach has been applied in, uh, um, in the Seven Estuary to look at the effects of barrage development. So Seven Estuary, massive tidal range, lots of potential for hydroelectric schemes. If you stick a barrage across the estuary, it changes the way the tide goes in and out. There's pros and cons of that, but on the, the research that we showed that if a lot of good quality habitat is lost because of that, then that can mean that the capacity of the seven to support birds um, declines. We've also applied this approach in different parts of um, Europe, but if we sort of really expand and think about where this approach has been applied globally um, we can think about other other places throughout the uh, that the approach has been used so the there's a few dots here that are a bit more distant than different parts of europe so the approach has been used to look at the effects of um, um, key development on another oyster catcher species in tasmania and i'm just going to focus very briefly on the application of the model to one of the sites in um, Eisenbeck Lagoon, which is a place in Alaska that's on the sort of southern tip of um, Alaska. So that seems a long, long way away, and it is. So here's two shots, the left-hand one of Pearl Harbor and the right-hand one of Eisenbeck Lagoon in um, Alaska. Superficially, they may look a bit similar, but the housing estates and shopping centres of Pearl Harbour are replaced by volcanoes and mountains around Eisenbeck Lagoon, and the dog walkers and recreation in Pearl Harbour are replaced by grizzly bears in Eisenbeck Lagoon. So there are differences there. But there's also striking similarities. So the Brent geese that we, we saw a picture of earlier and occurs in um, uh, Pearl Harbour and other places within Europe. There's a sort of a, a relative of that called the Black Brant that occurs within Eisenbeck Lagoon. And if a Black Brant were to turn up in um, 
Pearl Harbor, it'd be the sort of thing that twitches would be interested in seeing, quite rare. So we've got a bird that is almost identical in terms of the, the structure, what it looks like. It, the way it goes about being a bird is very, very similar. In Eisenbet Lagoon, Roger earlier also showed a picture of some seagrass around Pearl Harbor that's important. The Brent geese in Pearl Harbor eat this seagrass and the black brant in Eisenbeck Lagoon eat an almost identical species of seagrass that occurs there. So we've got an almost identical species of bird and we've got an almost identical species of food that they're feeding on. Eisenbeck Lagoon, and we've also got the same pattern of change. When the birds arrive in Eisenbeck Lagoon in the autumn, there's lots of food, it's relatively mild. Some of the birds are starting to overwinter in Eisenbeck Lagoon, despite the potential of it freezing over in the winter. But as winter progresses in Eisenbeck Lagoon, things get tougher for the birds in the same way that they do in Pearl Harbor. And the modeling that we've applied, the work that we've done in Eisenbeck Lagoon, shows that the birds that occur in that area are vulnerable to exactly the same sorts of change that the birds in Pearl Harbor are. So a very distant site, but the sort of conservation problems and the ecology of those sites are very, very similar. And by having a approach, the modeling approach that we develop, we're able, allow, allows us to see the similarities that occur between these two apparently quite different sites. Okay, so I think I've probably uh, gone on long enough now about the, 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 um, the work that we've done. So what I'm hoping I've got across to you is that those interests of bird watching and computing can be brought together. So all the computer programming that is needed to develop these models comes from my interest in those the original Space Invader interest. And also I hope I've got across that things that may seem very different in terms of geography can actually be quite similar in terms of ecology. So I'll hand back to Emma. Thank you, Richard. That was really interesting. And we've had lots of questions in the chat, one of which was around um, whether conservation organisations can get hold of this modelling. And I know you've worked with lots of organisations in this country and worldwide to look at the impact of different decisions that they make and um, where best to concentrate their resources. So could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so yeah, most of the funding of these um, the funding of this research or the way that the, the, the different models are developed it is usually coming from an organization that has got an interest in a particular site. So most of the work that we've done within Paul Harbour has been funded by Natural England, for example, and Natural England also funded other, other work in other parts. So yeah, it's sort of um, available through um, yeah, the sort of work that we've done with these organisations and we've we've worked with Natural England to allow them to develop these sorts of models in house as well. So, yeah, it is available. Brilliant. And we'll be sharing some links to kind of resources and web pages so you can find out more about this research and how you can get in touch with um, Roger and Roger after the event as well. So Roger's back with us now for the discussion and we've had lots of questions come through. So I'll try and get through as many as possible in the 15 minutes or so that we have left. Um, the first question, um, which has the most votes, is from Peter um, and is around pollution and monitoring pollution in Pool Harbour um, and other areas. And, and perhaps tying into that, Sue has asked about um, the impact of microplastics on the ecosystem. So how is pollution and litter um, having an impact on the environment of Full Harbour? Um, Roger, if we maybe come to you first. Yeah, thank you. Great, great question. Um, we've got a number of projects going on at Bournemouth University looking into this and uh, specifically one um, linked to the increased in uh, amount of nutrients in the water and the resultant um colonization and spread of green algal mats you may have seen as you uh go into whole bay uh, in uh, move across whole bay or go get on the train um crossing whole bay holes bay the amount of green algae that is present um, on the mud flats and we're looking into how that green algae might affect the invertebrates in the mud and uh, also, and Richard will be able to comment perhaps further, how the birds also are um, being affected by those green algal mats. So it's an area of research 
uh, which we're involved with here at Bournemouth, um, certainly a concern. Yeah, thanks, Roger. So, um, yeah, I guess in terms of the microplastic, so the way we think that they, they could affect birds is that the prey of the birds may eat the microplastics. And so that may mean that the, the prey don't grow quite as large. Lugworm, for example, would be a species that can be important for a lot of these birds. So if the food is slightly smaller, there's sort of less in it for the birds. And so that can make life a bit more difficult. In terms of the, the algae that spread, so anyone who sort of drives around um, Paul Harbour in a, over the sort of late summer period is very, very green. And it's probably getting more green each year. So um, a, a couple of research students have looked at the effects of um, the uh, the algae in the, the harbour on the, the, the sort of a, um, the invertebrates that live within it. So there can be some benefit of the algae. It sort of introduces a bit more primary production, a bit more nutrients potentially. So there can be some benefits, which can be good from the perspective of the birds. Some of the birds eat the algae, so the Brent geese eat the algae as well. And we've also got another research student is looking at a similar problem in, Christ, in Christchurch Harbour at the moment so yeah, there's sort of um it's changed but there's sort of pluses and benefits from the bird's point of view great and we've had a question from liz b about building work and construction companies so in holes bay for example um are construction companies under any obligation to provide wildlife habitat where they're building or richard i know you've worked with companies to look at how developments will affect the environment um for birds and kind of mitigate um that impact so do you want to, to take that one yeah, I, I don't know exactly whether there is any sort of obligation, um, because I think the the sort of um, the grassland areas that I mentioned or the sort of terrestrial areas around the edge of um, places such as Paul Harbour are really important for the birds. But most of the time when you go there, there's no birds there. And there can also be a lot of pressure to build on those areas. So I don't know exactly whether there is any obligation to do that. But um, I think potentially there, there should be because of the sort of uh, pressure. But often these sort of marginal bits around the edge, even though they're really important, aren't necessarily included within the sort of um, the conservation designation for some of these sites. That tends to stop at the sea wall, whereas the birds can hop over the sea wall and some of these places are really important but may not have the, the level of protection that they, that they, they deserve. I think I'll just sort of quickly chip in there. There is, uh, under the new environment bill, an obligation now to, for developers to um, think about increasing the amount of wildlife habitat associated with the new development. It's something called net gain. So there has to be a, an overall increase in uh, wildlife and habitat over and above what is there currently. Uh, it's still in its infancy in terms of how that will actually pan out in practice, but it's something which um, we will see more of in the next few years, I'm sure. And we've had a few questions around the species that um, live in Pool Harbour. So have you spotted more non-native species potentially as a result of climate change and, and kind of warming waters? Or are there any species that you found, say, in those artificial reefs or kind of around the harbour that have surprised you that you wouldn't expect to, to be seeing in Pool Harbour? Shall I take this? Uh, yeah, it's a really interesting question. And um, we... Because Paul Harbour is on the south coast of England, it's it's warm, therefore it's a great environment for new colonists uh, new that arrive to, to thrive in. And also with the connections through the continental ferry port and with the marinas um, uh, uh, here uh, with vessels crossing the channel, there's a lot of potential for colonization of non-natives. And we find that there is a lot of non-native species in the harbour and that the number are increasing all the time. So we've got non-native barnacles, we've got non-native sea squirts, clams of different types. Um, and just as a, a guide, I think um, intertidally, so on the seashore, 9% of the species that we find in Paul Harbour are non-native to the British Isles. Um, so it just gives you an idea of, of the proportion, but it's the abundance of those which is also important and the, so those few species can actually dominate um, in some areas on structures and also in the mudflats. Yeah, and I guess I could sort of take it from a bird perspective. So as Roger said, there's some new types of clam that have occurred. So over the last 
or it's maybe 20 or so years, there's been an increase in the number of man manila clams. So they were introduced for shelf uh, shell fishing purposes. They're really important from that perspective. Um, and they also, some of the modeling work that we did many years ago showed that they can actually be quite a good food resource for oyster catchers. So oyster catchers like to eat big, big sort of clams, the sort of things that we would like to see on a plate, I guess we would eat. Um, and so that if more, introducing more of that type of food for the but for the oyster catcher can be a good thing obviously it could be negative in other ways another invasive species is pacific oyster and in some places that's got potential to drastically alter the the ecology of a system that could have negative impacts and we've had a question from dave who's from the friends of um, hamworthy park which is situated on the harbour so is there anything that can be done in those non-marine environments to support local wildlife um here in pool um so i guess I, I i always everything from me is from the bird perspective <laughs> um but i guess the the birds are particularly if, if the birds are if some of the birds that are on the um harbour like the Brent geese are feeding there like after Christmas time then that's when they're really vulnerable to being disturbed so anything that could be done to sort of minimize disturbance to the birds that occur in those places particularly when they're sort of under threat because of the time of year I guess is something that we would be would be uh would be a benefit yeah I mean I'm a marine biologist so it's not my particular expertise but I'd endorse what Richard was saying and I think that anything that really any habitat improvements is going to be beneficial to wildlife um, and in urban areas and urban spaces um, this is particularly important not just for the habitat that is being created but for the people around as well so that you know in terms of how uh, their mental health and well-being is improved and benefited from seeing wildlife in their in their local backyard Brilliant. And Roger, we've had a few questions about the artificial reefs and potential future uses for those. Um, are they being used around the bases of wind farms, for example? And have you considered using natural materials such as limestone um, rather than concrete? So could you tell us about some of those decisions that you made in creating those reefs and, and what the future might hold? Yeah, well, of course, um, it's a shame, really, that we have to build anything in the marine environment, isn't it? Some arguably. Um, and yet, um, obviously, with the current energy crisis, we're being uh, told to derive more of our energy resources from um, uh, renewable sources. So wind farms are, of course, in the mix there. And uh, the wind farms, the offshore wind turbines that you see, um, will have some scour protection at the base. So to stop the tides and the currents undermining the foundations of the wind turbine. And these have been, uh, in many areas, created from concrete or rock armour. And in fact, we are getting quite a lot of interest now from uh, wind farm companies and others as to how we can use this kind of artificial reef research in trying to improve the foundations of wind turbines. And... Um, even though a pile of rocks might seem to be good habitat, it can be improved with more with the knowledge that we have gained and others have gained uh, in the, you know, lobsters and fish like holes and tunnels, for example. And uh, there needs to be more of them in these foundations that are being created. And the other question is important on materials. Now, concrete is not a popular um, material. Uh, at the moment because it, it is a it uses a lot of carbon or releases a lot of carbon dioxide I should say in its manufacture so what we're what we've been using in our research which is just a pilot project really it's not a huge artificial reef what we've been using is low carbon concrete and using um recycled glass from shattered windscreens for example as an aggregate within that concrete so we're trying to minimize our carbon footprint but others are taking this further and actually using um, uh, dredge spoilings which would otherwise be dumped somewhere else to try and reduce the amount of um, aggregates that have to be used uh, in these um, in the cements and there's lots of other cements um, stone again has its own carbon footprint 
Of course, it would have to get the stone from somewhere. Quarrying itself, itself is not popular. But it is a huge area of research going forward is what materials are appropriate to use in the marine environment and how our carbon footprint can be minimized. And there's a lot of work. And what's important is, is that this is interdisciplinary work as well. It's not just um, civil engineers now that are thinking about this. It's engineers, material scientists, and environmental scientists, ecologists who are involved in this work. And a question from Sonia, who's asked, what is the longer term effect of sea levels rising on wildlife, say in the next 10, 25, 50 years? So both from a kind of marine perspective and also um, on those bird populations, maybe if Richard, we come to you first. Yeah, I think it, it sort of depends whether the, the sea is allowed to encroach in land or not from the bird perspective. So on Paul Harbour, you've got a nice contrast between the sort of uh, the area on the um, the pool area and particularly if we think about sandbanks so sandbanks is one of the most expensive places in the world to live you can imagine this the sea wall at sandbanks may get higher and higher and higher as the sea level rises the effect that that's going to have is that it's going to be less intertidal habitat on those parts of pool where the, the bits of the harbour that bound onto pool but on the other side the more natural side there's more chance for the, the sea to gradually sort of uh move in landwards as it were so there's a place called um Litchit fields which is in the sort of uh, by Litchit bay to north of paul it's a, a royal society for the protection of birds reserve i think now but anyway it's a it's certainly an area that used to be terrestrial and has flooded recently so now it's an intertidal habitat where it's exposed by the tide so it sort of depends really i think and yeah. roger sorry can you repeat the question please emma Yes. How will the rising sea levels affect um, the wildlife that are living in and around pool over the next sort of 10, 25, 50 years? Yeah, well, um, that's right. I mean, I mean, we've got to do something, haven't we? Um, and uh, as Richard was saying, this sea will be accommodated to some extent by the natural habitats we have in the south and west of the harbour. Um, but it's what we can do with those developed coasts on the northern part of the harbour and uh, the kind of interventions that we've been experimenting with and researching have potential on urban coasts. They're not for everywhere, but if we can make our infrastructure more multifunctional, so our seawalls, as well as protecting us from, uh, um, uh, from waves and storms and winds, they can also be a home for wildlife too. And I think this is something we've got to think more about, you know, how we can actually make the most of what we can do um, in our urban areas. Um, of course, the natural areas are you know, fantastic. They've got priority and we must um, ensure that those are protected and conserved. What our research has been focused on is what we can do with the developed coast. Brilliant. Thank you. I'm afraid that's all we have time for this evening. So I'm going to have to wrap up there. But thank you very much to us two speakers this evening, to Roger and to Richard, for your time and for sharing such fascinating insights into your research and some of the creatures that live here in Poole. Um, and thank you to all of you, our audience, for coming tonight, for um, engaging in the chat, for asking such brilliant questions. Um, I've really enjoyed tonight's event and I hope you have too. Um, we'll be sending a follow up email after tonight's event um, with links to some of the research and resources that we mentioned during the presentations tonight. Um, and a feedback survey as well. So we'd really appreciate it if you could fill this out and let us know how you found the event. Um, it really helps us to ensure that um, the events that we're putting on are the best they can be. If you have enjoyed tonight's event, um, there's plenty more to come. So you can click on the green button at the bottom of the screen now or visit the Bournemouth University website to find out more about our upcoming public lectures. Our next event will be on the 12th of May um, around the lessons that we can learn from the past in responding to crisis and disaster. Um, we're going to close this event now, but the chat will remain active. So please do share any final thoughts or um, feedback in there. Um, and you'll also be able to watch the recording of tonight's event by visiting the same link that you used to join. That's all from me. So thank you again for joining us this evening. And we hope to see you soon. Good night. Good night. Night.